Welcome to the second part of how to respond and act to a hypotensive patient. If you have not watched the first video yet, please stop here and watch that part first. A link to the first part should appear on the, hopefully the right top corner now. Also, the link is provided in the description field. Let's start. Last video, we discussed how to identify and stabilize truly hypotensive patients. In today's video, we'll discuss how to recognize and identify the underlying process causing the patient's hypotension and shock. There are two very important elements we rely on here. Of course, history and focused physical exam, and believe it or not, the pulse pressure. Yes, pulse pressure. And soon you will find out why. So I usually get a quick history from the patient's nurse. I simply ask her, him or her, how was the patient doing earlier and right before they crash? Was the patient doing okay and suddenly crash? Or was it having some symptoms earlier? Was he requiring more oxygen? Or was the blood pressure trending slowly down? Etc. all these information. Now, why I mentioned pulse pressure? Simply because wide or narrow pulse pressure, soon you will find helps us narrow our differential diagnosis. Now, let me hop to the whiteboard to explain that to you. As all of you probably know that blood pressure equals cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. And you probably know as well that cardiac output equals stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. This means that blood pressure equals stroke volume multiplied by heart rate multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. Based on this, a hypotensive patient does have a decrease in one or more of these elements, the stroke volume, heart rate, or systemic vascular resistance. Now, a decrease in stroke volume and or heart rate usually causes hypotension with a narrow pulse pressure, while a decrease in systemic vascular resistance usually causes hypotension with a wide pulse pressure. This is very important to remember. Now, stroke volume problems include preload problems like volume depletion, cardiac tamponade, and tension pneumothorax, afterload problems like severe aortic stenosis, contractility problems like what happens in cardiogenic shock, massive PE can cause a preload and afterload problems. So all the above mentioned problems cause hypotension with a narrow pulse pressure. The causes of obstructive shock like PE, tension pneumothorax, and cardiac tamponade, on top of causing hypotension with a narrow pulse pressure, they also cause increase in jugular venous distension. How about decrease in systemic vascular resistance differentials? The most common one is septic shock, then neurogenic shock, liver failure, anaphylaxis, adrenal insufficiency, pregnancies, and medications like propofol. These problems cause hypotension with a wide pulse pressure. This is very important to remember. So see what's the pulse pressure in any hypotensive patient to guide your differentials along with your history and physical exam. I highly recommend you keep a list of this differential in your phone. Okay, now with the obtained history, the focused physical exam, including JVD exam, and recognizing what the pulse pressure, this all will greatly reduce our differential diagnosis to one or two problems. And here comes the role of ancillary testing. For all those patients, I get a stat blood sugar. The moment I get into the patient room, I obtain a stat EKG, a stat chest X-ray, an ABG, a CBC with differential, CMP, cardiac enzymes, lactic acids, type and screen if bleeding suspected. Further work up with more tests may be needed or required like a stat echocardiogram, stat chest CTA if PE suspected, or stat CT abdomen if acute abdomen suspected, etc. Now remember as a side note, your patient need to be stable enough to undergo a, a CT or MRI. Now let me provide you with some clinical clues here. If sudden shortness of breath and hypoxia think of pulmonary edema, aspiration pneumonia, PE or pneumothorax. If hematemesis, melina, rectal bleed, think definitely of course of GI bleed. If chest pain and shortness of breath, thinks of acute coronary syndrome and cardiogenic shock. Now hypotension post cabbage, think of tamponade. Obtain stat echo and inform the surgeon immediately. And I, I mean fresh cabbage, just done a day or two ago, not just a few months ago. Hypotension post myocardial infarction or revascularization. Think of mechanical post MI complications. Obtain a stat echo and inform the cardiologist immediately. Abdominal distension and diarrhea. Think of C. diff and toxic megacolon. Abdominal pain and hypotension. Think of acute pancreatitis, acute abdomen, or intraperitoneal bleed. 
fever and hypotension, think of, think of sepsis and septic shock. Also think of sepsis and septic shock of chronic indwelling fully catheter present or the fully is present at least for a few days. Think of transfusion reaction if the patient is receiving blood product transfusion. Think of anaphylaxis if hives, itching, flushing, swollen lips, tongues, or uvula. Now remember, altered mental status here is non-specific and can happen in all. Now the patient is physically in ICU. You may hand this patient to the ICU team. Now sit down and write your note and then update your patient family. In case you will be still following the patient in ICU, make sure to continue to monitor the patient vital signs and continue supportive treatment with vasopressors, IV fluid as indicated. Make sure to follow up on the test that you ordered and of course initiate source control treatment based on your final clinical judgment based on the process we just explained on how to narrow your differential diagnosis. Consult the subspecialties relative to your patient's needs immediately and make sure to tell them how emergent the consult is. Let's say your patient is having massive GI bleed, then GI needs to come and try to save the patient's lives right away. Or maybe someone with suspected acute abdomen who is unstable to perform CT abdomen, then general surgery has to come in immediately to assist that patient. Of course, perform immediate needle decompression or chest tube placements if tension pneumothorax or pericardiosynthesis if cardiac tamponade. Now also you may need to activate other protocols or codes in the hospital according to your patient's needs. Let's say your patient is having a myocardial infarction along with hemodynamic instability. You may need to activate code heart or whatever that code called at your facility regardless if there is ST elevation present or not. The patient in such case needs emergent revascularization. Now hopefully your patient has now become more stable. Sit down, take a deep breath and drink water. You did a great job. It's time to document the great work you've done to save your patient's lives and to update the patient's family about your great work. Now, sadly, I have to say, despite doing everything, sometimes your patient may end up dying. But that's okay. You've done everything you could possibly do to save your patient's life. In the end, I highly recommend you write these tips down or put them on your phone as a reference whenever you need it. If you find this video useful, make sure to share it with your colleagues, please. And if you don't mind, hit the like button as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next video.